Good morning. Pastor Lisa is gone today, uh, attending the uh, installation of our former intern, Ron Poe, at his new church in Illinois. Uh, my name is Meredith Sandlin. I'm one of the organists here, and I'm pleased to welcome you to worship today. We also welcome Pastor Patricia Shaw, who will be leading us in worship today. Thank you for being here. Uh, as far as announcements, Sue Green is collecting money for pastor appreciation, and uh, you can either give her money today or mail it to her at home. Uh, her address is uh, 33292 120th Street, Cedar Falls, uh, Iowa 50613. Um, and that Sunday will be next Sunday that we will give that to uh, Pastor Lisa. So do you have anything to add for that? The church council's planning to give her and Scott a gift card to a bread and breakfast. Thank you for taking care of that, Sue. All right. Uh, if you didn't grab one, make sure you, if you're here in person, that you have a little communion cup. They are in the basket at the back if you did not. Uh, this is what we will use for communion today. If you are online, we invite you to grab bread and wine or cracker and juice that you can use for communion. For clipboards today, we have one for October volunteers for worship. And then on October 14th, there will be a funeral planning workshop that Pastor Lisa is leading. So I will pass those around for people to sign up. Are there any other announcements today? All right, uh, please take a moment to prepare your hearts and minds for worship. Please stand. <clears throat> we begin with the confession and forgiveness. Let us be honest with ourselves, our God, and with each other, and confess our sins, that we may receive the forgiveness of a loving God. God, we sin by what we think, what we say, and what we do. In the name of Jesus the Christ, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the hymn. Please be seated.
God of hosts most gracious, God the Son who saves us, God the Spirit placed upon us, be with you all. community with one another. Form us for life that is faithful and steadfast, and teach us to trust like little children, that we may reflect the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Good morning. morning. First reading this morning is from Job. There was once a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. One day, the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity although you incited me against him 
to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, Skin for skin, all that people have they will give to save their lives, but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, he is in your power, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job took a pot's herd with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. The second reading is from the book of Hebrews. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. <clears throat> so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. And a reading from Mark. Some Pharisees came, and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to, to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. 
People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Here ends the readings. Today I'm preaching on the first reading from Job, from the first verse and the second chapter of the first ten verses. Many years ago, I took an interest in children's books. Maybe it was because I had worked in a children's library the first time I went to college. Or it might be because I find children's books so very interesting. They teach me something. But regardless of where this interest came from, one book that I have quoted from many, many times over the years, whether people know what I'm talking about or not, is from the book Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day by Judith Viorst, who wrote that book in 1972. And you recognize it. So, hopefully, those who are not familiar with the book, you'll run right out, check it out of your library, and quickly read right through it. But, someone pulled out some details, and so I quote that person, Alexander wakes up with gum stuck in his hair. He slips and falls getting out of bed, and he's the only kid at the breakfast table without a prize in his cereal box. At school, the teacher does not appreciate Alexander's drawing of an invisible castle. She then faults him for singing too loudly and for skipping 16 as he counts to 20. The dentist finds a cavity and the elevator door shuts hard on Alexander's foot. His brother Anthony pushes Alexander into a mud puddle. Remember, this is one day. And his brother Nick calls him a crybaby then when Alexander punches Nick, his mom sees the punch, and she's mad, of course, at Alexander. Everything is wrong all day. Lima beans for dinner, soap in his eyes, a burned-out nightlight. The cat even chooses not to sleep with him. I read a sermon by a preacher named Carla Pratt Keys, and I must admit today, I struggled mightily over preaching on the gospel text and the text from Genesis having to do with divorce and actually Jesus is talking about marriage. And so I switched over to the Job text, which also follows the theme through the, the uh, day here about suffering. So after I read that sermon, I am honest in saying that I was highly influenced when I wrote my own sermon today. But over the years, I have thought about Alexander and his no good, very bad day. 
remembering myself that even in Australia, and I'll come back to that, things can go wrong. I think you just might agree that things have not been good for many of us over these past couple of years, especially a year and a half. What with the pandemic that persists, 700,000 deaths as a result of that in the world, people losing their jobs and paychecks, children having to stay home from school and learn through the computer. Not that they don't like computers and, and tablets and all of that, but going to school only that way. Climate change is on our minds. What all that means about the extreme weather, hurricanes on this east coast and southern coast and fires on the west coast and a drought here in the Midwest. Many, many ways in which things just haven't looked so good over the last year. Of course, there are also consistent problems that confront us. We hear about them, if not daily, at least several times a week. Gun violence, political disagreements, poverty, throughout our country and the world, racism and all that that means for people who are called to live in community. Perhaps sometimes we too, like Alexander, just have a no good, very bad day. And we too might want to move to Australia like he does. Maybe you're not like me, but when I allow myself to feel like things are closing in on me, as they sometimes seem to do, I simply want an escape, whether it's Australia or something else. Then we come to Job. He, too, was having a terrible, horrible, very bad day or days. I certainly have never experienced anything like what he experienced. Last night I read through the entire book of Job, just to freshen it in my mind. But listen to these verses that we omitted this morning in the first chapter. One day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell on them and carried them off and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, Another came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another came and said, the Chaldeans formed three columns, made a raid on the camels and carried them off and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came across the desert, struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. I alone have escaped to tell you. Talk about it terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. What does Job do? He rose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshipped. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. 
The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We then learn, in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrongdoing. And it goes on. We find Job, where we begin today, on a pile of ashes. Suppose you don't know what has already taken place between God and the adversary or accuser. The Bible says Satan, but it might better be translated as the adversary or accuser. What has already transpired is God and the adversary have made a bet. One might certainly question the goodness of God in this story. At the time, however, that this story came about, people believed that if you were good, good things would happen to you. If something bad happened to you, it was certainly because of some sin, either of you or your parents. No one would expect such misfortune to fall upon any one individual as fell upon Job. Sometimes that's what we think in our lives too. When we hear things that go on around us, when we hear of deaths that seem to be senseless, how could that have happened to that one family? The reader is told that Job is blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. His integrity is perfect. He is not questioned in terms of integrity. So how can we possibly explain the treatment that he received? And if you will, the betrayal from God. We certainly might say it was undeserved and unjust. However, we do know about God's wager with the adversary. Job has lost everything, even his seven sons and daughters. If we're not disturbed by this portrayal of God, then why aren't we? Samuel Ballantyne, who wrote a commentary on Job, calls this description of God the most disturbing description in the whole Old Testament. So how can I imagine anything good? about this story in the Bible. I can even believe that God can bring about good out of the pandemic, a time that seems to be filled with unrelenting sorrow and disagreement, upheaval, sickness, and death. Even so, when I wonder, I wonder when people look back on this time, of so much destruction, death, and lack of compassion, we might say, what will be said maybe a hundred years from now, just as this is a hundred years from that 1918 pandemic? What can be said of the times when we feel so downright sad and depressed over events in our lives? over what happens in the lives of our neighbors, over what we fear just might happen next. In 1958, Archibald MacLeish wrote a play based on Job. The play is called J.B. MacLeish said, there's always someone playing Job. And he went on, there must be thousands, 
millions and millions of humankind, burned, crushed, broken, mutilated, slaughtered, and for what? For walking around in the world in the wrong skin, the wrong shaped noses, eyelids, sleeping the wrong night in the wrong city, London, Dresden, Hiroshima. These days, maybe we would say Chicago, Kabul, or Port-au-Prince in Haiti. We've seen Job everywhere, haven't we? His children died, his work all for nothing, counting his losses, scraping the boils from his skin. There is always someone playing Job. Job, perhaps like all of us at one time or another, in the content that comes through the chapters to the end, Job will ask some difficult questions. What does Job's story say about his faithfulness, about his integrity? What does it say about God's faithfulness when we realize at the end of this book in the Bible God has given him back way more than he had to start with. One of the ideas I used to put in sermons at weddings where I presided was to ask the couple Indeed, I would ask the entire assembly that had gathered to consider their own stories as a part of the larger story. Our own stories are not the whole story. God offers each and every one of us a much bigger story. And we are in that story, too. It is the basis of our faith. Today is World Communion Day. This day began with the determination of people like Job. It started in 1933, around the time that Hitler and Mussolini were proclaiming the Rome-Berlin Acts and Chiang Kai-shek declared war on Japan. A pastor who was part of establishing this day said this, we were trying to hold the world together. Worldwide communion symbolized the effect to hold things together in a spiritual sense. It emphasized that we are one in the spirit and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, like Alexander, we too sometimes experience horrible days. Some days there are those who are barely hanging on, emotionally, spiritually, physically, financially, whatever it may be. We cannot imagine the stories some people share about their own lives. Can we see them and ourselves as being like Job, even in the worst moments of our lives, still trusting and remaining faithful to God, knowing our story is not the whole story, knowing there is a larger story that involves Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection, a story that we cling to 
today and every day because of our trust in God who is faithful to us. It's a story that assures us that God is good, that God transforms us into people who are free in this world, free to care about our neighbor, that we are whole, although not yet fully, as God intended for us at the beginning of creation. That we are one in Christ, no matter how much division and lack of unity is before us today. We know that in the end, there will be no division. There will not be a lack of unity. In Mark's gospel, for example, look at the way Jesus blesses and loves the little children the little children who are not thought to account for much in biblical days. It's much different today, praise God. They were very vulnerable. They were not thought to have much worth until they grew, up, grew into adults. But here in this last little part of Mark's gospel, and we might wonder what it's even doing there, connected with that piece about divorce and testing Jesus. Here, we understand that all of us, even the most vulnerable, the weakest, and the least regarded, are in God's care. Always. Even on our Terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days. My friends, that is good news.
we continue with the Apostles' Creed as we profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, May children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Holy One, you have raised up faithful leaders throughout history. Empower those discerning a call to ministry and all seminarians, that they continue to be formed for the sake of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. You have established a diverse and beautiful creation. Revive declining species and preserve endangered lands. Cultivate in us a sense of wonder for the world you created. Lord, in your mercy. You desire for us not to be alone and to live in community with one another. Strengthen relationships between nations and peoples that we celebrate and support one human family. Lord, in your mercy, you share in our experiences and struggles. Bless all who live with any mental or physical disability. Inspire creative communities, spaces, and environments that are accessible and hospitable. Lord, in your mercy. You have established and nurtured relationships that extend beyond those gathered here today. Bless members who can no longer travel to worship with us and remind us of their continued role in this community of faith. Lord, in your mercy. You promise eternal life to all your children. Thank you for the people of faith who have gone before us. Strengthen our trust we have in you. Lord, in your mercy. We ask for healing upon those members that we remember in prayer. Bailey Neal and parents Chad and Tara, and Reineke, Don Prusner, David Albert, Carol Watson, Jim, and Jane Campbell, and all of those that we remember in our hearts today. Lord, in your mercy. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have had in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. And we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our and In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. For those who are already familiar, you know that you peel back the paper over the bread. And also for those who are visitors, we'll peel that back. This is the body of Christ given for you. And then you carefully pull back the tab over the wine. The blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Please stand. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.